Hi, everybody. Welcome to our June meeting of the New York State Forum Web Drupal web, uh, user group. Hi, right. I'm a little rusty. Haven't done this in a while. Uh, I'm Eric Steinborn. Um, I maintain the group and try to curate people to speak. So if you uh, want to talk about Drupal in any form or fashion, please let me know and we'll get you guys up here as well. Uh, we're always looking for great presentations. We have two really great presentations today. Um, I'm, hope, I'm trying to put together a panel either for our next um, meeting or the meeting afterwards. Normally we've taken a break during the summer, but I'm going to eschew a break for the summer for the group because it seems like when we pick up back in the fall, the, we have a bit of a limited you know, potential plus, uh, or limited, limited uh, participation and we sort of build back up. Uh, but what we're doing as well is uh, Mike's helping us broadcast these through WebEx and we're recording them on YouTube. So if you can't make it in person, if you have some sort of vacation plan or something like that in place, then you know, feel free to go on vacation with the knowledge that you'll be able to be enlightened by whatever has happened in the Drupal user group while you were gone when you get back. So uh, our two presentations today are with Git. Uh, according, uh, up until yesterday, we weren't sure we were going to have our first presenter here, and we're so happy that he's here. Jason Cortez is here. And our second presenter, Justin Winter, is here as well. So Jason's going to be talking about Git today, uh, giving you some introductory stuff. Because so we've we've discussed this. This is our this is our Drupal beginners corner for the for the user group. Um, you might think, well, I'm a beginner. I shouldn't be using Git. You should be using Git as a beginner. So I'm just going to say that. You know, some people call me opinionated. I am. Uh, but we should all be using some sort of source control for our code because if we're not, then we run into issues where um, you know, it's just typical of not source control. So something gets changed, nobody has a reference to that previous code, things like that. Uh, and then we end up with lots of bumbling and fumbling through old people's code. So uh, Jason's going to talk about Git and get us as a, as a nice introductory course on Git, show us how to use it. And then Justin is going to talk about a relatively new project, newly released project. It's been in development for a long time. It's called Aquia Bolt or BLT. I'm not sure how they're referring to it as. Um, it's, it's either a sandwich or it's something to do with electricity. So uh, that is going to be a really nice presentation. Um, we've, Justin and I have actually discussed it and we're hoping to make it a two-parter. So today will be a nice overview of, of getting it all set up and then next time that he's here, we're, it's going to be a big, deep, deep dive as a real, like it's a, it's a very advanced topic, but it can get even more advanced than it will be today. So, you know, just understand that you might not get it the first time around. It's, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of different technologies that are morphing into each other to create this really powerful um, local development environment for, for your projects and deployment and testing and all, 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 this, all this stuff as it comes through. So without further ado, I will introduce Jason. Jason's going to talk to us about Git today. And um, at, the, at, the end of each at the end of each session, we'll have uh, time for questions. So if you have questions, you can send them to the WebEx, or we'll have questions uh, in, internally here. And just again, we will be posting this online. Afterwards, I send a, a link out to the, to the uh, to the email list at the end of every meeting just so that everybody can see the, the recording and get links to the presentation materials just in case. You know, Justin, I know he's been writing a lot of background information about his presentation, so we'll be, you'll be able to really sort of go along with all the stuff that he, he talks about today. So thank you, guys. Jason. All right, Eric, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, this Git presentation by explaining that uh, the, the link to this presentation is available right now on uh, GitHub. So you see this link down here below. You can actually uh, open that up on your phone, your browser, your, um, <coughs> at your desk, and follow along as we go with this. So without further ado, we'll just dive right into it. So uh, some presentation about getting started with Git. Everything that you ever wanted to know about version control. So a little bit about myself. I'm a full stack developer. I've been working in the industry for about 15 years. I've presented at several conferences, uh, WordCamps, um, 
ranging from accessible Ajax to NoSQL development. I'm currently working with the NY WebNY Drupal team focusing on the development of uh, platform support. So what is Git? Git is the most widely used uh, version control system available right now. It's actually kind of the standard, I would say. So out of all the web shops that you might encounter, probably 90% of them are going to be running this, uh, short of Microsoft shops. Um, it's a very mature version control system, and it's been actively maintained since 2005. It was originally developed by Linux Torvald, who, uh, of course, is the creator of the Linux operating system kernel. So we're just going to dive right in. Um, and bear with me as uh, you follow along. I'll actually give you a demonstration of this after, after I go through the slides. So with that said, getting started with Git is actually very simple. The links to download the software are just readily available online. I've provided them here on the slide for you so you can click those and you'd be presented with the page to download the software. So the way that Git works is it starts by um, initializing a repository. That's, that's your way of telling Git that you want to track and control something. So whether it's a presentation, project that you're working on, or just a code base, um, the git init is the way to kind of start off with that. So there's several ways to start. Um, you can initialize your own git repository, but if you have something that's pre-existing out there, you're able to actually clone that. So for example, if you're working on a team and you guys are collaborating uh, GitHub, for example, you can just provide a path to the repository. Uh, that would be your GitHub address. And you can actually pull it down locally with the git clone command. So a lot of people don't really grasp the workflow of how Git is actually operating. And here I, I'm trying to demonstrate how, how simple it really is. There's really three main areas that you need to concern yourselves with. That being the working directory, the index, and the head. Uh, the index is commonly referred to as like the staging. Um, so you may hear that term as well. So your your files that you're working on, they're all going to live in this working directory here. And by adding them to the stage, you're telling Git that you'd like to index them and keep track of what you have there. And by committing things to the head, you're actually telling Git that you'd like to save that and create a new iteration version for the commits that you've made. Now, um, the commands for using that are rather simple. So for example, you can see two here. We've got the git add command and the git commit. So by using the git add command, you're proposing those changes to the index of the stage. So you can see that here. All those your files that live in that working directory will then become part of the stage. That's the first step in the basic workflow. To actually commit things, you simply need to follow up with uh, the git commit command and append just a commit message. So that's kind of um, how you tell Git what this is and also other developers that might be working on a project with you because later on you'll see where that comes into play. So uh, pushing changes. Now that your changes are in the head you're, and you're working your, <coughs> your local working copy, you can send those changes to the remote or local repository by using a git push command. Now uh, git push just accepts a few variables. In this case, it's going to be origin, Origin, in this case, is going to be the remote that you're speaking to, and master is referring to the branch. Changes to the master, uh, whatever branch you want to push it to. Really don't have an uh, impact on the individual branches that you're working on. So, um, 
by using the Git Remote Add Origin, you're able to add additional um, remote repositories. So, for example, like your GitHub repository that you'd like to work on remotely, or it could very well be just a remote server in a, in a different server environment that you might have. So that brings me into branching. Branching, uh, branching is really the core of the version control. This is where you test out what you, you happen to be editing or improving, um, typically referred to as a feature. They isolate your changes from the main code base and allow you to kind of independently work on things without impacting everyone else's progress. Once you're completed with all of your changes and confident that your code is in working order, you've eliminated any bugs, you're able to merge that right back into the main repository and not really impact anything else that's going on. So, for example, if you are working on a feature and a colleague that you might have, Together, you guys can <coughs> merge your features without impacting the main code branch. So, getting started with branching, you really need to understand the checkout uh, command for Git. In this case, um, you can see the first statement here, Git checkout v feature x. It's actually telling Git to create a new branch for you named feature X. Now, by using the checkout master, you can tell it which branch you want to work on. So, for example, if you want to go back and look at what you have on the master branch, you use that checkout command again to switch back over. Once the branch is created, of course, you can eliminate that, that B um, option for the command, as it, you, you won't have to recreate it twice. Uh, and finally, the last uh, the last uh, option for that command branch is the delete, which can remove that branch that you might be working on and eliminate it from your local. It does not impact the the remote repositories that you might be working on. So, for example, if you have that branch stored on the GitHub, you won't delete it locally by using that. You actually have to use a push to delete it remotely. So, update and merging. Sometimes you want to make sure that you're using the most recent code, so Git provides you some commands on doing that. Um, in this case, the command to pull, the Git pull command, allows you to pull down or fetch the remote branches that you might have out there. And here, I've kind of elaborated on the Git merge command speaks to bringing what you might be working on locally to what is actually the latest version of the master branch uh, on your remote. In both cases, Git tries to auto-merge things, but there are some cases where you'll have uh, conflicts, which will help you by adding comments to the source code and provide you detailed information as to where those conflicts, the conflicts might be. And by manually opening up that file, you'll see those comments provided by Git, and you can kind of address and resolve those merge conflicts yourself. After uh, changing what you need to, you can uh, merge everything back with the Git command for, for that particular file name, which would push it back to your staging environment and allow you to continue with your merge without conflict. Let's see, uh, another useful command is the git diff, which will show you any differences between one branch and another. Another useful tool is uh, the git logs. This, this is a good place for getting information. So, for example, if you wanted to see the commits provided by a particular developer, you can actually locate that in the logs here. Or if you wanted to kind of construct a quick uh, tree-like structure command, demonstrate what's going on with the branches and give you kind of a visual interface with that. You can actually pass a command to your log, which will present that in a little ASCII format with colors. Uh, another nice tool is uh, the name status, which uh, will show you only the files that have been changed um, on your 
staging environment. Of course, with any of the Git commands, using this dash dash help will provide you like a resource for learning a little bit more about those. Components. So um, sometimes things go wrong, and uh, here we can uh, kind of look at how Git allows you to fix some of those things. Um, Typically, as you'd imagine, <laughs> the quick fix is just simply replacing some of those files that might be corrupt or creating issue for you. So, by using the git checkout command and passing the argument of file name, you can actually replace the, the local file that you're working on. So, maybe that happens to be index.html with what was last committed so that you can kind of revert back those changes. Not deal with whatever may have went wrong, and we were able to kind of take it again from the top. If you would uh, like to just kind of blow out everything and uh, start from the top, you can use a git fetch origin, uh, which will kind of pull down the latest, um, the latest uh, copy of the code base for you. So, let's see. Next up, I was just going to show you a quick. Um, demonstration of kind of getting things set up here. So to elaborate, let me kind of quickly show you what's going on here. <coughs> I'm going to be working in this Git directory right here. So this is just on my desktop and I've uh, through the command line navigated to that address here. And what I'm going to do is actually start by telling Git that I want to uh, keep track of this directory. So in this case, we're using the uh, git initial, initialize command, which we touched on earlier in the presentation. That was really the first or second slide. So by firing off that command, you can see what's happening here. We're telling Git that this, this directory is now going to become a repository, and you can see the address provided there. So from this point forward, and you can tell by seeing like this uh, master, sorry, the screen is wrapped a little bit there, but um, that's now tracking that as the master branch for your code base. So what I'm going to do quickly is just kind of throw some code into that directory so that we can get an idea of how all this works. So by running the command git status, we're going to ask git if it's recognized anything that's changed. And you can see here that it's mentioning um, untracked files. So what that's saying is that it has been watching this directory and recognized that we've added this index.html file to the directory. Now, again, everything is kind of command-centric, so we have to tell Git that we'd like to add that to our staging environment. So by using the git add command, do this by individual file or by just using the period option, which will just incorporate everything in that directory. You'll see that it's now recognized it and added it to the staging environment. All right, so when we have it in our staging environment, the last step is actually going to be the git commit. So as I showed earlier in the slides, this process is very simple, only three steps. So by passing this command, it is going to recognize that, uh, <laughs> um, firing 
submit message here, you'll see that it's actually added that to the head, the kind of master branch in our case, and it's being tracked from here on out. So had we been working in like the GitHub environment, this, these changes would now be available to all the other developers that had access to the uh, GitHub repositories. So as I said earlier, just very simple, easy to use. And I think it's uh, a matter of just simply being intimidated by the command line that uh, prevents people from really embracing this. And for what it's worth, it's not very much of a learning curve. It's just kind of getting familiar and comfortable with the environment. So uh, just some useful hints. Uh, Git has a built-in GUI, which um, GUI in the, the loose sense of the term it's not an actual interface that you can work with, but it provides like uh, color coding for the, the text that's on the page in addition to formatting uh, the output that it provides you. Here I've provided some links and resources. Um, these are graphical clients which you can utilize to kind of work with Git. Um, it provides uh, several, but uh, you might find that other vendors, like, uh, for example, uh, Tower, they're, they're very good at uh, kind of streamlining the process as well. Here I provide a little bit of information on finding resources for uh, whether it be training or books or guides that you'd like to use. Um, because, of course, we all learn differently, whichever is easiest for you. Um, and we all have access to the Linda.com series of uh, training. So, if you go and Google uh, or search for the Git Essentials course, you'll find an entire, I think it's like five hour course that goes into real finite detail. Um, there's actually a community book that's maintained by a press, uh, which is free to download. That link is here. The Git documentation is a great source for finding kind of quick information on the fly. And Git for Humans is actually, um, really good book that um, kind of takes the, the convolution out of it and puts it in real frank, easy to understand terms. So something you might want to look into. Okay. And now, do we want to do comments at the end end or? Uh, I think per presentation. All right. So. Um, I, one, one thing that I wanted to see, <clears throat> can you show just an example of doing a Git clone? Because a lot of people are going to be you know, cloning from a repository online. I would say yes, but I don't have the uh, remote key set up. For well, if you use uh, HTTPS, it'll, oh. it'll just prompt you for using a password. I'm also going to be doing it in my talk. Either way. Well, for sake of just kind of uh, conserving time, I know a few people want to get into uh, the next presentation. I'll just take some general questions right now. Do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I've been using Git for a while, and I feel like um, I end up using, I don't know, five of the same commands again and again and again at most, maybe. Do you feel like... <laughs> You know, is it worthwhile digging in deeper? Because I know Git is much larger, has a much larger command set than five different, you know, pull, clone, branch, merge. Um, you know, do you really need a lot of the other ones? Are there any other commands that you feel like are super useful? Obviously, Git log you mentioned. I, I think uh, the first step is kind of getting familiar. Once you've worked with it a little bit, uh, some of these uh, commands that Justin was mentioning here. But uh, what will happen is you'll come to a point where um, you find this repetition in your workflow. And by kind of doving a little bit further into some of the additional commands that are available on the website, you can locate the documentation on using commands that might help to streamline some of those day-to-day uh, -day routines. So I would definitely say um, make sure that you're comfortable with it first before kind of but uh, once you're there, there's definitely a, a plethora of uh, other Git commands which will help you streamline your workflow, particularly when it comes to conflict resolution. Once you 
you get into larger team sets, you'll find that that's kind of a common occurrence. So. Uh, uh, any other, um, also really? just really quick to mention on top of that, it's, those commands are great, you know, those, those say six-ish commands that you're using are your typical commands, but it's the triggers that are on those commands as well that you're going to be utilizing you know, to, to get you much more, like my git add command has the dash cap A on it as well, uh, because I ran into an issue before and now I just use it all the time. But just understanding that, you know, those commands are modified and enhanced by those different triggers, you know, so, so you're git checkout dash b, that, that's a trigger for that command and you know, doing, looking at the help manual for any of those commands, even the, even the ones that you're using all the time, git push, git pull, git commit, they, they all have a plethora of different triggers that can be associated and that can really help your game as well. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, in the, the term that uh, Eric's using, triggers, those are like the options for the command. So you can add kind of finite detail to what you want git to do for you as you go through it. So definitely another area to research uh, and streamline your workflow as well as you kind of become situated. And then, I mean, the only other thing I wanted to, to ask you about is um, merge tools. I mean, from my experience, a lot of people get up to speed pretty quickly with Git is, you know, as far as Git clone and um, Git add, Git commit, all the, the basic commands, but dealing with merge tools, um, Merge conflicts, uh, especially you know, in on the command line, I found to be really difficult. So, you know, I, I use Kaleidoscope personally on my Mac for for doing uh, merge conflicts side by side diffs. Are there any other tools that you do use? Or? Uh, well, when you install the uh, Git Bash, they actually provide you a tool uh, on the Windows platform anyway, um, which allows you. To But um, for, for those of you who might not be familiar, a, a Git conflict is when you try to check in or pull something that might overwrite one of your files or you might overwrite somebody else's file because of changes you've made. And so now you have a single file that differs in a way that has to be resolved. And so now you have different ways of resolving that. And there's a very, there's, you know, you can manually work through with the diffs, um, you can also visually work with those two files and choose which ones are, are, are different. So uh, if you're a visual learner, maybe starting off with one of these uh, graphical user interfaces to it is, is maybe a, a, an area to start off with it uses the learning curve and kind of uh, you'll see the arm stage changes, stage changes that speaks to your, uh, your stage and your commit. So if, if would like to see things, you're not going to really get that from the command line, but there are, there's definitely tools available where you can um, get a, uh, a front end interface to kind of work with things and dissect them. So, uh, yes, if you have conflicts when you merge, this can definitely help uh, sort some of that out for you. And again, I've provided some links to uh, the uh, GUIDs in, in the presentation slide deck, so if you'd like to revisit those after. Uh, Feel free, and I'll get you started on your road to uh, solving those merge conflicts. When I'm on Windows, I use Win Merge. Yes, that's a very powerful tool. Um, interesting to use it for. Is it a, a plugin that you're using? No, it, it it has it has the capability to pull up the repository. Yes, good point. And <laughs> I find that some of your um, some of the tools available. HP Storm is, is a lot of that will be built in, baked in under the hood, so you can just kind of configure it in your development environment and just take it from there. It'll be kind of seamless in your workflow. You won't have to think about it as you go. All right. So um, with that said, I think we'll just wrap it up and let uh, Justin take over.
All right. My name is Justin Winter. Um, I've been doing Drupal development for quite a while. I think since Drupal 4-ish, so a while. And I've been doing web development since like 1996. Um, programming for a long time. And uh, uh, this talk is about Acquiable. And I'm actually more excited about this project than I have about than I have been about pretty much. Um, anything the last few years, so this is pretty good. Um, the, I have a, a blog post in progress. Um, right now I'm, I'm dealing with some markdown issues. So if you want to follow along, I would go to the bit.ly link here, and I'm essentially just going to be going through this, uh, this blog post. It's pretty much it's a set of instructions um, uh, that I've been writing up for the last few weeks. So. This talk is less of a lecture, it's more of a presentation. And I'm going to be moving through a ton of stuff pretty quickly, but hopefully this gives everyone a high-level overview of the, the technology itself. I put together screen grab videos, and let me just pull up the, the GitHub page here so you can kind of see where I'm going. Well, hopefully it doesn't require you to log in. It does. So if you just go to uh, github.com, Justin Levi, Justin Levi .github.io. So if you just go to my GitHub page, and you should be able to go to my repository and then GitHub.io. Uh, and it's going to be the Acquia bolt setup. The other probably less ridiculous way to get there is to just go to Justin Levi and setting up Aquia Bolt. And like I was saying before, the, the formatting is a bit janky on this, and I'm trying to figure that out. Obviously, the, the Jekyll formatting doesn't work the exact same way as the GitHub formatting. So I'm just going to be going through this. And then uh, here's the screen grab videos. And I put quite a bit of time into these, so check them out. Uh, and I have them broken down into different pieces. So initial setup, Drupal VM integration, and then uh, running theme tasks and managing Drupal APIs. So what is Acquia Bolt? Um, it's an opinionated, holistic approach to building Drupal projects. So Drupal is a lot more than just downloading um, and clicking a couple buttons, configuring, installing a couple modules, and, and calling it a day. The ecosystem that we all operate in is really complex, it's really confusing. Um, in April of this year, Acquia released the open source project called Bolt um, that was born out of Acquia's professional services team. And so the project's a collection of best practices, um, and it's from the folks who probably know Drupal as good as anyone. And the this talk specifically is going to cover the following, uh, what Bolt is, how to get set up, Drupal <coughs> VM integration, being and running uh, the included uh, shell script tasks, and managing your Drupal 8 site with Composer, theming and front-end development. I probably won't be able to get too far into that. We'll see how far I can get into it. And then uh, BHAT, PHP unit testing. I would love to get into deploying and continuous integration, but again, we'll see how far we can get in this one. So this is a ton of stuff and um, things we're not going to cover. Features integration, because I'm not very good at features and I don't like features, but I need to get better at it. Uh, custom module with Drupal console and building unit testing into that custom module. Um, and then automated testing using live content and then visual regression testing. All really important topics that I might uh, throw into a deep dive next time. So here's, I have three videos on YouTube. I'm going to go ahead and try to I tried, I was up till midnight last night trying to get the front end set up video working and I couldn't get it working and so I scrapped it and felt like I was cramming for my final today. So I decided to just move on. So because I like Agile, the problem statement in this case is as a Drupal web designer and developer, we're faced with a ton of decisions as far as our work environment, our testing, our tools, 
best practices, and general strategies to get work done. This creates confusion and can affect productivity. So how this project helps, leveraging Bolt takes the guesswork out of trying to get many of these desperate technologies to all work in concert. Bolt can also help create a unified development platform for larger teams, which should improve productivity um, and it has the potential to massively impact everything from the onboarding process for new developers all the way through continuous delivery of the actual product that you're developing. So this just means that teams can focus more on the unique business impact of the project versus spending a ton of time on the project architecture, which we've all spent a ton of time on. So how to get set up. Um, there is a few readme's that come with the Acquia Bolt project. So let's first go to the Acquia Bolt GitHub page here. So it's just github.com Acquia slash Bolt. And all these links are at the bottom in my talk notes. So here's the project page. And there's a few required readme's that we should definitely check out. And the first one is the onboarding README. And this just talks a little bit about the system requirements, operating system, network considerations. This goes through the script of initial setup, a lot of the same things I'll be covering. So the documentation is really good. You just need to know where to look. Along those lines, if you go to the template README folder in this repository, so it's bolt template README. Here's a list of all of the readmes that are available. And another really good one, especially when you start getting into testing, is the tests readme. This talks a lot about uh, the types of testing, functional testing versus unit testing, executing the scripts, so on and so forth, BHAT, best practices. Really, really thorough readme. And the guys in this project are also fantastic. So if you have any questions, throw them up in the issue queue. They usually get back to you pretty quickly. So you can do this on Windows. It's a bear. It's, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. That being said, you can do it. I ended up going through this process um, on my uh, Windows 7 machine. And you, one, tip would be to try to do all of the work within the virtual machine within the, the Linux box. That way you, you deal less with the Windows side of things. You, you, there's a lot of issues with NFS on Windows and shared drives and things like that. So you can do it. In fact, the Acquia Bolt team, team says right on one of their, on their onboarding README, we highly recommend that you do not use Windows directly for development, many development tools, Drush, Gulp, et cetera, are not built or tested for Windows compatibility. Furthermore, most uh, continuous integration solutions um, do not permit testing on Windows. So this was a pretty strong statement from Acquia to encourage people to use Mac. Now, like I said, you can do it on Windows. Don't let it scare you off, because if you go through Windows, if you go through this process on Windows, you're going to learn a ton of stuff. And it's good stuff to know. So. The requirements up front are Vagrant and VirtualBox. You've got to uh, go out, download, and install both of those. And then from there, the initial setup is just to clone the Bullet repository. And so we'll go ahead and do that. So I'm going to change directories. And let me just zoom in here so you guys can see. So I'm going to change directory to my site folder. And I'll just open it here in uh, Finder so you can see what's going on. So right now I have pretty empty folder, and then I'm just going to do a git clone bolt project. into a folder called BLT. And if we look at this uh, directory now, we have this folder, BLT. And I'll CD into this folder. So I'm changing directory. So my working directory now is, is BLT. 
So then the next step is that we run this command here. Uh, we're running the shell command clean, and then right after that command, we're doing a uh, configure. So this goes out, grabs some composer dependencies, and installs them into that same folder, that BLT folder, and then it generates a couple files. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to open this folder up now in Sublime. So, my notes here. This creates two files in the same folder: local settings.php and project.yaml. So, there's we're, we're going to open up project.yaml first and make some changes. There's some optional updates. You can update the vendor name, the machine name, the human name, the profile, etc. And then um, we'll we'll update the host name as well. So, let me go in here. Project.yaml. So we're going to change the vendor name to NYS Forum, and then a short description, you can leave that as we'll change the machine name to NYS Forum, the prefix. This prefix will be used for git commits later on. This enforces a certain style of git commit. You don't really have to worry about that too much in the demo. So the human name, we'll just call this the process. Process. Oh. Okay. And quick question, uh, will the Evernote document um, be available after the meeting? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, it, the Evernote document is essentially what the blog post is, so it's pretty much a one-to-one. -one. I need to update the, uh, the blog post to, to have better formatting. So Here's a gotcha that threw me off for a while. Um, this project comes with the lightning installation profile out of the gate. If you don't want to use the lightning profile, you have to change it here. So I'm going to change it to standard. And then you, this is the, 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 the big gotcha. You have to change contrib to false. And the only way you can find that is digging through the issue. So if you change that to false, themes will leave as is. Local um, will change the host name to .vm. And then the GitHub repo. And what What's going to happen with this uh, remote here is you actually define where you want your project to be committed by default in the continuous build process. So here you can define where you want it to be pushed to after it goes out through that continuous build process. So what I, I have a repository set up on my uh, GitHub account. Just grab the URL for that. So it's just, cool. and so I'm going to add another item here, and then Drush, instead of um, local, we're going to change this to VM. Actually, no, that's incorrect. I'm going to leave that as is. And I think that should be it for now. The next file that was created in that first command was this local settings.php. And we are pretty much going to just leave this as is. This looks like a, like a copy ish of Drupal settings.php. This is essentially a copy of the, the basic Drupal settings. One thing to note with this project is that um, there's all these templates. So if we look at the folder structure here, it's it's a template of what your final Drupal project will look like. And so it, it takes all these configuration settings and it just uh, copies those template files into a new location and then changes out all the, the, the default files and settings with the <coughs> configuration options that you set. So from here, let's just go back to my notes here. Those. At this point, we just run the following command. 
uh, create. So it all will go as well. Let me just make sure I'm in the right directory. Create. And we're done. So let's go ahead back to our sites folder. And we now have a new folder, NYS Forum. And so that NYS Forum has our entire Drupal site, folder structure, everything ready to go. That's not a trivial thing. It set up a ton of stuff for you. So not only did it set up a best practices folder structure, it created tests for you, both as PHP unit and BHAT tests, with examples for each one. And um, there's a little bit more setup to get it, uh, to go through the entire process and get it final. But this structure is in place, ready to go. So at this point, we can change directories to that new folder. And I'm going to go ahead and try the Drupal VM integration piece of it. Um, I'll get it started. The, that last uh, Composer update went pretty quick, so it seems like the internet connections actually work pretty well. This might take a minute or two. If it, if it starts lagging, I'll pull open a video and you can watch it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll try to make it happen. So let's talk about Drupal VM a little bit, because Drupal VM is, is, is not required for this project, but Bolt comes out, out of the box with Drupal VM integration built in. It's pretty recent. It's still, I think, uh, one of the comments that shows up as you're running it is that it's experimental. It you, you doesn't have all the functionality that Bolt comes with. But from my experience, it has everything that you would need. And the reason I like uh, Drupal VM is, is it, it's very well supported. It's pretty mature. And it has a lot of the working pieces that um, you know, I played around quite a bit with, uh, um, with Docker. And Docker is definitely faster for getting new machines up and running. But the, the problem I found with Docker is that it requires a little more fiddling, getting the different servers all connected. And it doesn't, I haven't found a, a Docker project that, that integrates as easily. And so there's a lot to be said about leveraging a project that's well supported and tightly integrated. So Drupal I think VM is actually looking at Docker. I, I've been reading that too. So Drupal, I think ultimately Drupal VM, at least pieces of it, will definitely start going in it, toward Docker. So it, if nothing else, it's a great project to follow along with while it's evolving because as is, is easy as Aqua Dev Desktop and MAMP are for setting up a, a, a local LAMP stack, the problem with it is that you end up with these very custom configured environments that don't really represent what the final server is going to look like. And that's one of the major strengths of Drupal VM is that your, your local development environment ends up being very, very similar, if not a, an exact copy of, the final uh, server platform. And that's, that's huge. Um, you'll, you'll find bugs earlier you'll start to understand that server environment a lot more. And so let's see here. To jump into the next steps to getting Drupal VM set up, can you just really quickly talk about what Drupal VM actually is? So yeah, Drupal VM is, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I think I have a note in here to actually talk about that. So all, of, all it means, a virtual machine just means that you have one operating system running inside of another operating system. So your host computer, in this case mine being Mac OS, has another operating system running within a piece of software called Virtual, or, uh, virtual Machine. And that's the Linux operating system, Ubuntu 1404, 1604 in this case. And that runs inside of the Virtual Machine. Now the, I don't know if it's the correct term, is the scripting? language. I'm not sure what Vagrant actually is other than the facilitating uh, language that actually drives virtual machines. So we're using a combination of Vagrant and virtual machine in order to get Drupal VM up and running. It takes a little bit of uh, wrapping your brain around at first, but once you, once you start working with it, it's not too bad. 
Um, group the, again, I always go back to the documentation. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to we're going to go into this new develop or this new folder, and we're going to run the command vm init. So this is, this could take a second. It's going to go out. It's going to download a bunch of composer dependency files. It's actually going to download all the composer dependency files for the entire Drupal site. And it's going to create uh, a new folder it's called box. And in that folder, it's going to be config.yaml file. And so while it's doing that, I'll go ahead and pull up Drupal VM just so we can get better idea of what this project looks like. So this is the Drupal VM project, and here are here's the documentation. So the documentation is fantastic. I mean, for most public uh, repositories, you don't ever get documentation this good. And again, the issue queue can't find something here, you can always go back to the issue queue and find it. Um, if you can't find it in the issue queue, which is pretty rare that somebody else hasn't run into the same issue as you, you can go and just post a question and, and Jeff uh, at Drupal VM, the founder of Drupal VM, will get back to you pretty quickly. So it's also worth noting that Jeff works at Aquia. Yes. Yeah. To work on Drupal VM. And, that, and that's another um, important aspect of Drupal VM is that so Aquia Professional Services is putting out this project called Bold. And Jeff Geerling, the founder of Drupal VM, works for Acquia. And so they're they're very they work together. And you know, again, the company who knows probably the most about Drupal um, supporting this platform, it makes a lot of sense to at least pay attention to what's going on there. It's a huge gotcha, and Eric I think is running into this recently is PHP 5.6 on Drupal VM. You, there's some additional configuration that you need to do in order to get that working. The, and the reason that you, you care about this is some of the bigger hosting providers like Acquia don't yet support PHP 7. Um, when PHP 7 comes, becomes available, it's probably a good idea for all of us to move in that direction because it is a much better PHP. So, that being said, you know, look at the documentation if you need to if you need to run PHP 5.6. So that documentation should be up to date now. So we're going through the installation. It's actually running pretty quick, so good. It's, this is automated, it's just going out. It's running this composer dot yes. No, that is the wrong composer. Let me just open up the NYS forum folder in Sublime. Can everybody see that? I keep yelling at me if the, the font's too small. <coughs> so here's the composer.json file that comes with Bolt. And I'll get into composer.json a little bit later and how to manage your site. Drupal 8 allows you to manage your site with composer.json. This is this is a big deal. No longer do you um, have to use make files, and you can still use make files, but you can use composer.json in order to manage a lot of your dependencies. And everything just works. Um, has fixed uh, version numbers, and uh, you can also have variable version numbers. There's a lot you can do with the composer.json file. I'm not going to dive too deep into it right now. Just know that this is also kind of one of those amazing aspects of this project. Everything that you see here, I mean, this is a very curated list of best practice libraries and tools that Acquia Professional Services has, has decided, you know, they need for every project. And so we're going to go ahead and put this list and the versions and everything that we feel like a project is going to need out of the gate. So it comes with Drush, it comes with PHP Unit, it comes with a lot of the things for running BHAT tests, stuff like that. And we're done. Wow, I kind of amazed that I was able to go through this process live. So, um, 
So let's go back to the folder structure here, and we can see that, that by running that last command, bolt vm in it, <coughs> what it did is it created this box config file among downloading all of these vendor dependencies. So that's what it went out. That's the, the lines of code that you're seeing uh, go by on the screen there. It was going out and downloading each one of these. So Drupal 8 running in Symfony, uh, downloading Drupal Core, a bunch of other things in here. So at this point, what we can do is we can modify the config.yaml file that Aquia Bolt comes with. We need to um, we need to add a couple of extra uh, libraries, technologies, to uh, for doing some of our theming and stuff later on. So. All we do is we open up our config.yaml file, and we can just add this right above the extra packages here. And so we're installing AdMiner, Drupal Console, Node.js, and Ruby. So AdMiner is just allows us to um, to control our MySQL database or access our MySQL database a little bit easier. Drupal Console is new for Drupal 8, an awesome command line tool for doing all sorts of things. Or with Drupal, well, Node.js, um, and Ruby. Uh, I don't remember why we need Ruby, but we do. So from here, after we've added that, we can then just run the command. Vagrant up. Oh. So this is the joys of doing live demos. There's something I missed in the process. I should have shown you this before anyway. So this is what virtual uh, virtual box looks like. Pretty simple piece of software, and it it just shows you the uh, virtual machines that you have installed on the site or on the, in the software on your computer. Let's see if I can figure this error out real quick. If I can't, I'm just going to abandon this one and jump back to my computer. Um, shouldn't have had to. This should have this should have brought up an entirely new machine. There's a dot vagrant folder in here. I had to delete my the contents of my dot vagrant folder yesterday because I closed a repo that had already used the vagrant folder. most likely won't have this issue. Um, I'm having this issue because I've been building a bunch of virtual machines lately and this is probably just a, a, a conflict with one of the recent virtual machines I, I created. So we'll just jump back to, let me see if uh, there's anything in the video that I need to point out. Uh, I mean, this is essentially what it looks like when you when you run that command. If you guys can watch this, it just bigger up runs. 
it goes out, it grabs a bunch of dependencies for the virtual machine, runs through this process, and it, um, I have this sped up in the video, and so this process takes a good 10 minutes, maybe longer, depending on your internet connection. It's a one-time operation. You don't have to do this every time. Once you get your virtual machine set up, it's pretty much good to go. Um, you only need to. Check All right. So that looks like it completed okay. All right. See, it works great. Everyone. Something that was narrated. Oh. All right. So with that. So what I'm going to do is instead of uh, this live demo getting that virtual machine up and running, I already have a virtual machine from last evening that I was working on, and I'll just get this up and running. So the command to get your Vagrant virtual box up and running is just Vagrant up. trying to do some cleanup before this talk, and the rule of giving a talk is never mess with anything before you give a talk, but <laughs> you always mess with something. Or something. So I have to go out, go into my collection of great projects folder, and I need to move that back, I think. So let's try that. Real quick question: When you're building this, when you're building these um, boxes, so to speak, it's it's self-contained Ubuntu, basically. It's not there's no like CentOS or different Linux versions. There's just that there's, one. There's different version. There's different. You can create a virtual machine for any operating system. So if you want to use CentOS, go for it. If you want to use Debian. You can do virtual machines for Windows. You can do, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. And there's official versions for all of them. So that worked, and I could probably go back and do the MIS forum. Let's do it. I'm going to get crazy. And I'm going to try to get two virtual machines running at the same time. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to go with the project that's actually running. So, let me close this down, regain my closure here. All right, so. Back to my notes. Um, so to create your virtual machine, you just use Vagrant Up. After you make that small configuration change, it's just Vagrant Up. Now to connect to your virtual machine, you just use the command Vagrant SSH. So I'm now within the, the Bolt folder. I can tell that the Bolt VM is running here. And I should just be able to do a Vagrant SSH. And at this point, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be connecting directly to the, the virtual machine via the terminal, and I can do cd var www bolt, 
And that's a problem because what we're seeing here is that the, the folder, this folder has not synchronized correctly with the the folder on my local file system. So if I go to my sites folder here, so it should show me all these files. So easy fix. I'll log out, and I should just be able to do a vagrant reload here. And so these are these are the commands that you will run as you go through this process. Um, especially when you move files and folders around, I've noticed that Vagrant and Virtual Machine don't really like that too much, especially if you've had a virtual machine in one folder and um, that virtual machine was recently running. If you move that to a different folder, a different virtual machine might actually break as a result. So you just have to be aware of some of this stuff. Don't be afraid to Google it. There's a lot of, um, a lot of information out there. All right, so now, if I do the Vagrant uh, SSH, see if that works. All right, we're good. So that reload forced Vagrant and Virtual Machine to go back out to that folder and synchronize those files. Not, not that you need to know that, but um, if you run into a situation like that, you can always just do Vagrant reload. That doesn't work, and I think I have this in my notes here. So if you run into errors, there's sort of three steps that I found work. Um, first, do a vagrant reload. Then do a vagrant reload dash dash provision. If that doesn't work, you can always stop the virtual machine, destroy it with vagrant destroy, and then do vagrant up. Um, and there's, there's random reasons sometimes why you have to do that. It, once you get it set, you don't have to fiddle with it too much. So, all right, we should be good. And now if I go to, I should show you that in that process, you have to, um, yeah, Vagrant test definitely helps. Um, one of the things you have to mess with when you're dealing with Vagrant virtual machines is your host file. So if you want to access your virtual machine that gets set at a specific IP address, the Vagrant virtual machine by default um, comes as 192.168.88.88. You want domains to access that virtual machine, you have to add that to your host file. I've gone ahead and added both VM and uh, subdomains for all the other applications I've installed. So at this point, I can load up 192.168. And this is what Drupal VM comes with out of the gate. It just gives you this really nice dashboard. It lets you know what's installed, your MySQL information, your extras, PHP versions, and so forth. And then at this point, I can also just go to Bolt VM. And sure enough, this is my site, albeit a little messy because I was doing some front end work last evening. It did not pan out. So I'm just going to change the settings right now. We'll just set the instructions to the default. So now if I go back to the site, it should happen a little bit better. All right. So one of the gotchas, you obviously, um, there, there is an issue with the aliases file. So Drush site aliases, Drupal VM aliases, that needs to be updated if you change your, if you change your vendor name and your machine name and your host name here, you need to Open up your Drush folder, site aliases, and then your Drupal VM aliases. So
So these aliases get created by default. You need to update those in order for uh, everything to work. So it's specifically that right there. So if you change the, the name, you will need to update that. That's one big gotcha. All right, so the command after you get everything set up and running, or after you uh, make all those configuration changes, is bolt sh setup. And I'm going to show you a video of that because it was pretty cool. What it does. task and so we'll go ahead and run that make sure we're in the correct directory it's really quick for the most part and what you'll see here is if everything works correctly I had I actually had one of the gotchas here. I left the alias as .local instead of .dm. I needed to make that change. A few different aliases. We'll go ahead and try that again. Going, it's doing an entire Drupal installation, setting up the MySQL database, and it looks like it. our Drupal site was set up, and it all went well. Now should you run that command? Our dashboard page here. Fortunately, it looks like our host name is not correct here, so this may not work for us. And then your site just loads right after that. So things you could all do before with Rush. Sure enough. Um, but this is a very different structure of things. And at this point, what we would want to do is we'd want to commit all our changes back to our uh, repository. And so let's go ahead and do that. Feel free to stop me at any point, too, if anybody has any questions. So, and within my Bolt folder, I've not committed this back to my GitHub repo. So here's my GitHub repo. I should be able to run git branch develop, git add, everything, git commit. This is my first Bolt commit. And then the next command is to do what Jason did earlier, which is I need to edit my, my global configuration because a uh, new Git repository requires you to do that. A little trick with that. <clears throat> so I end up using Tower for most of my Get configuration. And Tower makes it pretty easy. So I have my map turn develop branch. Here are all of the files that I just committed. And then I don't have any remotes right now, so I'm just going to go ahead and add a remote repository. And 
How many user privacy? So we have that remote added, and I'm going to check out my develop branch. Ah, I didn't commit this yet. So I'll just call this. Ah, that's what it's. That's the issue. So the commit command did not work above because it did not follow the specific rules that are established in this project.yaml. So as I mentioned before, the prefix BLT is required. So I have to actually create a different style of commit. So it's a BLT dash 000 in this case. Absolutely. It's pretty much, there's so many things to learn from it. And everything from the best practices on Git, everything from testing, everything from folder structures and how a Drupal site should be set up. And it really does enforce those best practices. So it is pretty, pretty awesome. So what I need to do here is You guys might actually be able to help me out on, on the best way to do this, because I, I probably always do this wrong. Um, I accidentally committed all my changes to master locally, so what I end up doing here is just merging master back into develop, and it's probably totally the wrong way to do it. But So now it's merged back in. Now I can push this up to I can push this up to GitHub, and what we'll see here in a second. So nothing up on GitHub yet. I didn't get into SSH keys because that's kind of, it's a little bit more of an advanced topic, but that just allows you to push up to GitHub or any server as long as you have shared keys. Um, makes it a little bit easier than HTTPS. So now if I refresh, we are good. All right, so. Do Fing and running the included bolt uh, shell script tasks next, and we'll do managing your Drupal 8 site with Composer, and I'll breeze through these ones pretty quick. So, first of all, what is Fing? Um, Fing is just another task runner, and I before this project I didn't know anything about Fing, and I was actually a little annoyed that they they decided to use Fing. I was like, you know, Gulp and Grunt seemed like they were standard in the industry, so why are we using Fing here? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, you know, um, although many Drupal developers deal with JavaScript on a pretty regular basis, you probably more likely have PHP skill sets on your team. So to use Fing, which is built on PHP, it might make some sense because you can leverage those PHP skills. And What's a task runner? Task runners have been around for a long time. Like Ant was kind of the granddaddy, I think, of, of many of them. And Fing is built on top of Ant. It's a 
formalized way of running a process of steps. And so Bing works off of an XML file. The XML file is actually pretty standard to, or pretty easy to look at. So all your Bing tasks for the project live inside of the build folder and uh, core Bing tasks. And they're broke, they're categorized. So here's all your setup tasks. And if you look at them here, you can you can kind of get an idea just by by skimming through it what's going on. So you have a task called setup, and here's your targets. It sets up B hat. I probably missed a couple. All right, it calls this setup task, which it then calls setup build. What's important to know about Thing is they it works a little bit like building blocks. So you have these very small tasks that do specific things. And then you can group them together to do much larger tasks. So for instance, if I'm in this directory and I do, if I run bolt sh-l, that's going to give me a list of all the thing tasks I have available to me. I'm going to zoom out here a little bit so that all in line. So as I was saying before, so we've, we've got these small building blocks, so set up actually goes through and sets up BHAT, it sets up the build process, it cleans some things, sets up Composer, does Drupal install, sets up Drupal settings, and it sets up your Git hooks as well as doing some updates. Um, tests is the same way, deploy is the same way. And so that that's basically thing. I mean, for this project, just know that you can get to all your thing tasks by doing SH-L. A couple of really cool commands is local sync. So if you have your Drush aliases set up correctly, you can just call local sync. It'll go out to your remote database, pull your pull it down and synchronize with your local development database. Super powerful. Let's makes development really um, awesome as far as that's concerned. Uh, bolt deploy. It's useful if you manually have to push something out. Think of a, a hotfix. So you're working locally on something, and you need to you see a bug in the live site or on the master branch, and you need to get it out quick. That's when you would use bolt deploy. Um, hopefully, if you use this project and you get comfortable with it, you'll be using uh, continuous integration like Travis or Jenkins or something like that, in which case, you're no longer even pushing code out to your server anymore. You're using these automation tools. And I'm going to try to get to that. <coughs> so BHAT tests, and um, you can run that through Bing. What's, to, what's important to note is that Bing is, again, I was kind of annoyed by this at first, too. I was like, oh, why do we add one more layer of technology between the actual commands that we're going to, we would be running anyway? So now we're introducing Thing and PHP on top of, let's say, a test command that we'd run right on the command line. And there's some good reasons every now and then why you'd still want to run that command at the command line. But keeping your focus all in one area is actually really nice, too. You deal less with that context switching penalty where if you have to jump between BHAT syntax and PHP unit syntax and in all these different environments, it's hard to jump back and forth. Whereas if you can just focus on a very simple thing task, it makes it a little bit quicker. So managing Drupal 8 site with Composer, um, there's two, way ma two main ways to do this. You can edit the composer.json file directly, or you can use the command line interface. I prefer the command line, but um, I was going to uh, do both, but I'll just show you how it works from the command line and then quickly show you how, what it looks like there. So the project comes with a composer.json file at the root at the root folder. So in that uh, composer.json file, you have two main sections that you're going to concern yourself with, the require and the required dev. Require is what would ultimately get pushed out to your end server. Um, required dev is what you need for your local development. So if you need uh, your local development and your CI server, so if you're going to be running tests and things like that in an automated way. 
the if you want to um, include a, a module, let's say, say I want to include the, uh, the admin toolbar, um, the way that I would do that is I would just add a line here. I would do Drupal admin toolbar, and then I can specify my version number. And I believe I have that version number here. So just 8.1.15. And the way you can find that is going to Drupal packages. I can open that as well. And just do a search for admin toolbar. And if we find it here, we it actually gives you the command that you can run from the command line, composer required Drupal admin toolbar. It also tells you the version number, the latest version number. This user interface is pretty awful as far as doesn't actually build the command exactly as you need it, but you can get the information from this page. One important thing to note about the composer.json um, repository is that this URL to packages um, is going to change soon. So Drupal has an official composer URL that they're building. It's not ready yet. There's a pull request on the Aquia Bolt project right now, but it's not ready yet. So that, that'll change soon. It shouldn't have affect things too much. The only thing it will affect is that all these requirements, um, they will no longer need the, the 8 uh, to specify which Drupal version each dependency is for. Um, the composer will be smart enough to know what module to get based on what version of Drupal you're running. So you can actually use composer for Drupal 7. Most people don't know that. Um, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Yes, but I'm, um, I'm using a version of Bolt on the Drupal 7 site that I've sort of customized. And I'm, I, I'll probably push a branch up before too long. It's not, again, so many of the things like the DHAT test, PHP unit test, um, a lot of the thing tasks won't work, but a lot of the, the best practices as far as the Drupal VM, the folder structure, a lot of those things you can apply to, to any Drupal project, um, of Drupal 7 or Drupal 8. It, it's very fragile to use Drupal 7, but you can do it. All right, so that's adding um, the dependency right to the composer file directly. Let's try to, let me show you what it looks like to use the command line. Uh, uh, anybody want to give me a good module? Jason, give me a module name. So, uh, That actually might be. <coughs> Let's search for it. Too late, Jason. We're at the end of the day. So, all right, composer require Drupal diff and then 8.1.0 alpha 2. So, let's see here. So, we're in the bolt directory. Actually, I need to. Not save this one. And all right, so let's take a look here. So let me just do a search to make sure we don't have it. We don't. So we're looking at require here. We don't see diff. And so we're just going to do a composer require. Drupal, diff, and then because I have the full diff memory, 8.1.0 alpha 2. So this command is going to update our composer.json file 
add the version number, and then it will go out and actually download that dependency and put it where it needs to go based on what we have set in our install paths. So we're saying that anything that's of type Drupal module should go into the doctor's modules contrib and then the module folder. So another <coughs> nicety of using Composer is that you can specify some of these things and, and put different uh, uh, dependencies in different places. So that may take a moment. There we go. So it goes out, it clones it, downloads it, it updates. Now, the one thing that threw me off for a while with Composer is that you have two files. You have your composer.json file, and then you have your composer.lock file. And I probably can't speak to this with any great authority, but uh, my understanding of the composer.lock file is it's kind of the compiled version of the composer.json file. You don't ever mess with the composer.lock file um, that I know of. And so you pretty much, the commands that I end up using with Composer are Composer require, Composer update, and Composer um, install, yeah, Composer install, yep. All right, so at this point, everything looks good. We see our Drupal diff in here, good to go. Um, we could go ahead and enable that. Let's just make sure that our site is still up and running and as expected. Um, we'll go to the extend tab. Let's just make sure it's showing up here. Sure enough, it's there. And let's use a uh, let's use a Drupal console to enable the module. So. <coughs> So we'll do uh, Vagrant SSH. So we'll go into the virtual machine. We're connecting to it with an SSH session into the virtual machine. We're going to change directories to var www um, bolt. And then we're going to do, I think we actually need to run this within doc root. So we'll do cd doc root. And then Drupal module enable. So, oops, I got a little over my tab there. So, Drupal list should list out all of my commands, and I still don't, still don't know these by heart. So, module install. That's what I do. And then diff. So, Drupal module colon install diff. And there is a keyboard completion with Drupal console, but it's super slow. And I, I read some. Things that you can use to, to increase the speed. But yeah. So now, if we just refresh our page here, and Drupal 8 will definitely throw out some errors for you still. So don't get too scared by that. Just do a refresh and hopefully they go away. <laughs> so now it's enabled, in, you know, just in contrast to what you would use with Drush previously. So I, I like the command line interface. It, it still feels a bit like an alpha here and there, but it's, it's getting there. I think it's actually going to be a really powerful tool going forward. I um, actually dove in a little bit more composer than I wanted to. So the next piece I was going to walk through is theming and front-end development, and your brains are probably all mush at this point. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is just go through the continuous integration portion of it because it's pretty awesome. And so I'm going to skip. Maybe we'll do the theming and front-end development. I was going to, what I was going to walk you through is uh, I'm a fan of Bootstrap mainly because I know it. I, um, I tend to use Bootstrap for its grid system and for normalize and for some of its basic functionality. So Pretty cool to see how you can take the current bootstrap uh, theme, uh, sub-theme it, uh, use Bower to grab your bootstrap for dependency, and then swap out less for SAS, and, and it just 
runs pretty quickly. So if you want to follow these instructions, it actually should get you um, through that process. It's pretty cool. And then what I will jump down to here. Let's see if I can get this to work. I, I doubt that I will. <laughs> we'll try. So, um, who here knows about Travis CI? Does anybody? Any, Chris, you know, Jason, you know of Travis CI? You guys know of it? So, Travis is um, it's an automated build service. There's two parts of Travis there's the paid. TravisCI.com, and then there's the free TravisCI.org. And anybody who wants to use TravisCI.org with a public repository can do so freely. And it's pretty amazing. You can use it to build and automate <coughs> any project in any language you can pretty much think of. It's, I think, one of the, the coolest things to come out in the last you know, many years. And it's, it's pretty awesome. So, privacy at work. I'm logged in, and let's go to my repositories. And let's turn on. So, you have to connect your GitHub profile to TravisCI.org, and then it's a pretty simple interface. You pretty much just go in and flip the switch. Now it's connected. And there's this little button called settings. And from here, it gives you your current, your branches, your build history, your pull requests. And then build only if Travis.yaml file exists. So I'll go ahead and, and turn that on. And let's quickly look at our Travis.yaml file. So this is just a set of instructions for um, what the Travis environment should look like to run your project. So this, very similar to how Drupal VM sets up a virtual machine to load your Drupal project, Travis does the exact same thing. It actually uses a container, container system similar to Docker. And Travis builds this environment, loads your project into it, installs Drupal, and then goes through any of the other scripts that you have in here. So. Um, you know, it does composer update, it uh, does composer install, installs node, it runs a git diff, and then it actually goes through and runs your BHAD test. So, and then you can comment this out to automatically deploy back. So this is what I think is probably one of the coolest things about Travis is that you can, not only can you have it build your project, run your tests, and, and if you're not familiar with BHAT testing or PHP unit testing, specifically BHAT testing, because I think it's one of the easier to get into, check it out, because it's, everybody should be testing more. If you test more, your projects are going to be a lot more solid, and um, it creates a safety net that as you build your project further, it's, um, you're going to run into issues less and less. So, but after you do your testing, you can actually have it deployed back to the same repository, to a different repository, say if it's on Aquia Cloud, you can have it pushed directly to Aquia Cloud if all of your tests is fast. So if you build the test suite that says, you know, when I'm on the home page, I should see these elements. When uh, an administrator logs into your site, or not an administrator, when an editor logs into your site, they should be able to click through to these pages and perform these functions. All those tests pass, then just automatically push it out. You can almost forget about the whole deployment process of building these projects. You can let your developers develop, and if you have an awesome enough test suite, and I've seen this happen on a number of projects, if the tests pass, as developers push commits, it automatically just pushes out. So there's a lot of projects online and a lot of websites that are constantly being updated. There's no more grand launch days. It's always a launch day. There's, you know, there could be 15 commits that get pushed out on any given day. 
That's that's an amazing thing. Um, all right, so at this point, <coughs> I believe all goes well here. Let me just make a small minor change to the project. <coughs> Commit this, and I'm going to push it. All right, so now if I go back to Travis CI, automatically shows me that it's building. So just by connecting Travis CI to my GitHub repository, it knows that, hey, that push got thrown up on your GitHub account. I'm going to go ahead and grab that code, and then here's where this is really cool. Um, Insight, the log can't be shown, it's, it's building. This usually pops up pretty quickly. The, um, <coughs> from my experience, these builds, uh, if you were to build it locally on your Mac, it takes anywhere from, I think, seven to 10 minutes um, on Travis, their servers are, are so dialed that it's, you know, two minutes about. On Windows, unfortunately, it's like 15 or 20 minutes. And this may take a little longer to do for the first time. Um, is Travis CI um, allowed? Um, I know that there's some agencies that have Travis CI <coughs> accounts. I know WebNY has a, a Travis CI account. Um, one, I believe. Uh, it might be more than that, but it's. Um, I think that there's. To answer the question, I'm not sure. Like, I, it seems like they should if they don't. It's it's, it's a, a super professional tool. And it, it is a little spendy. I think the, the pro account is like 150 bucks a month, so you know it's not it's not a trivial expense by any means. Um, but you can actually see here it running, it's doing its thing. And this is what's amazing is this is not me doing anything. This is it just reading that Travis.yaml file. It's installing all the Composer updates. Downloading Drupal core, applying the patches. Oh, it fell. Downloading Drupal this, so it's going out and finding it again. And a lot of these other modules that it's downloading it, um, come with the Lightning profile, um, so you could you could definitely streamline this a little bit for sure. All right, so this should hopefully go through. It'll run the VHAT test. I'll show you that in a second. And um, it'll, uh, it'll hopefully give me the build successful, in which case that's what we could then push it out to your group. I covered a ton. Um, any questions? Anything?
And I apologize for jumping back and forth a little bit. Um, I was hoping that I'd run into less on the issues. Part of me feels like it's good to show that because that's the reality of this process is you just have to be a little bit flexible and, and know that you're going to run into issues here and there. And knowing how to solve them and just the mindset and where to look is really important. The downside of that is it can be a little bit scary if you haven't experienced it first. Um, don't be uh, too timid with this stuff. There's a ton of resources out there. The Acquia Bolt guys are really helpful. The Drupal DM guys are really helpful. Um, you know, feel free to ask questions about this. I'd love to hear your feedback. If you if you go through the process and start working with Bolt, um, let me know what you think. Uh, you know, just to throw it out there too, the, the, the web and wide distribution that everyone's working on, or that, that's being worked on rather, um, is uh, is built on top of this Bolt framework. So it's it's starting to get some pretty high profile attention, and um, I definitely see it gaining more attention as time goes on. So. <coughs> Sure. No, that's a great question, actually. So, um, Dev Desktop is it's a good, it's actually a great tool, and it integrates with Acquia Cloud really well. I, Acquia, it was really smart for Acquia to build Dev Desktop because it just uh, simplified the process of, of working with their technology. Unfortunately, um, I played around with Dev Desktop when it first came out on my Mac, and I, I kind of abandoned it right away because I had my own LAMP stack that I was using and it, I didn't like, uh, it felt a little clunky in some ways and so I, I got rid of it. When I got a contract with the state, I ended up um, using it again and I got super frustrated because it was, I had to work on Windows 7 and it's just, it's just a dog on Windows 7. It does not work well. And, um, I mean, once you get it up and running, and if you're doing front end work and theming, it's it's okay. Like you can get around it. Um, so Drupal VM, I've been playing playing around with Vagrant and VirtualBox for a while, and so Drupal VM kind of came out. Or I caught wind of Drupal VM and started playing around with it. And I I saw the potential of um, not only increasing the speed because page load times on the Windows machine were an order of magnitude faster using Drupal VM. Um, it also had the potential of kind of creating that unified development environment between everybody on the team, which has a huge potential for just increasing efficiency. And it also teaches you a lot. You know, these are the servers that you're working with. Understanding basic commands, like how to change directories through the server, how to list the contents of these directories, how to work with these servers is a good skill set to have if you're, if you're in this world. So, I got into it basically because um, it, was, it was a necessity to, to speed up my development time because it was demoralizing to work on, on <laughs> dev desktop. That was basically the reason. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the build failed, so I'll have to go back and look at why that is. Um, but maybe I'll get into that next time. I know. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. Basically, just getting started, I just have something that Tim Cromie from WebNY wanted me to mention. Oh. Night camp. You could just move up. I was really trying to. <laughs> <laughs> Night camp is July 8th and 9th, and WebNY has a bus leaving from Wolf Road. 50 Wolf Road, I'm assuming. I have heard. So Wolf Road <laughs> directly to the UN, so it's door to door service on Friday and Saturday. Friday, down at night camp at the UN, are the free training sessions. 
I know that they made a magical appearance for about 12 hours on the Knights Camp website, and then they disappeared again, the actual sessions and the information. But um, usually they, you go to Knights Camp, you show up, and you search the little signs that are up for the sessions that you want to attend. Um, free training is free training, though. So it's encouraged that you go with the rest of us. Take a bus trip. Uh, it comes back that night, Friday night, and goes again on Saturday morning, same location, if you want to do so. The event itself is free. The bus ride is free. But you have to register. Um, if you're interested or you want more information, it's WebNYSupport at its.ny.gov like five minutes ago. I think you can mail for information and we'll get you registered if you want to go. Thanks. Uh, July 8th and 9th. Really, really early. We have to be there by 9. I think the event starts to be around. So I'm, I'm thinking around the 